Joe Biden has called for a significant de-escalation by both Israel and Hamas and has urged both parties to pursue a ceasefire. Now, this is an incredibly weak stance. It ignores that this is not a mere conflict, but an ongoing occupation, and it ignores how casualties have fallen overwhelmingly on one side, just to call for a ceasefire, to call for, for both sides um, to, to stop exerting violence. As Ash Sarkar said in a recent show, it flattens the whole history, the whole context of what's going on here. However, whilst this is an incredibly weak statement from Joe Biden, it is still an improvement because up to this point, he has actually been resisting any call for a ceasefire whatsoever. So even the most tepid stance, he has been resisting, not just resisting, he's been blocking it at the UN. So some improvement. Meanwhile, in Palestine, a 24-hour strike has come to a close. Now, this is really significant. A strike across the whole of historic Palestine, or Palestinians taking part, or the vast majority taking part, shutting down businesses for 24 hours at protest, at apartheid, at occupation, at the airstrikes in Gaza. Now, during that strike, peaceful protesters were subject to intense repression by Israeli security forces, and that included this incident at the Damascus Gates in East Jerusalem. So what you saw there was a peaceful protest and then the Israeli police throwing stun grenades at protesters. Now, a stun grenade, if you live in, in Britain like me, you probably never experienced one. What that means is the police throw something at you that bangs so loudly, that flashes so brightly that you're completely disorientated. For a few seconds, you struggle to see um, and struggle to to hear. Completely disorientating, which is why everyone runs away because it's so you know, horrible to be around. That's the purpose. As well as those stun grenades, we've also seen over the last two days um, which is not new, by the way, but it's, it's come to, to light, been been raised, become more prominent over the last two days, is Israeli police have been spraying rancid water on Palestinians. Now, this is so, so appalling, really created a lot of a lot of shock on social media, quite rightly. We're going to show you a clip that sort of explains what's going on um, in this respect. This is reporter Mark Stone, um, and this is a clip from Sky News. And here in Sheikh Jarrah, about an hour ago, we saw... Uh, something which happens a lot too at the moment. That is a, um, a, uh, a water cannon, but it's not of the type that you might see uh, in Europe or, or America uh, because it's got stunk, uh, skunk water in, which is, uh, has a rancid smell, takes days to get off your, your skin. Uh, and um, what it does is it, um, they spray it uh, ostensibly for crowd control. But, but I can tell you, because I was here and I saw it with my eyes, they were not controlling a crowd that needed to be controlled. They were controlling a small group of youngsters who posed no threat to them, and yet they fired the water cannon uh, into a Palestinian community and all over Palestinian houses. The Palestinians and uh, human rights groups say this is effectively a form of collective punishment. And lastly, uh, uh, down at the Damascus Gate a little bit earlier on, as part of this mass movement of, um, uh, of Palestinians, uh, uh, expressing their views uh, a group of palestinians were walking out of the damascus gate of the old city and up the steps there uh, and then without any warning the israeli police threw stun grenades and everyone everyone fleed again uh, unnecessary crowd control we've put this to the israeli police we've asked them why they're doing this sort of thing uh, and they say where they uh, where they make mistakes they investigate but you know uh, i've worked here for quite some time uh, and i can tell you that when you ask the israelis for investigation they say they're doing one but you never actually get the result so those are the facts. That's what's happening here on the ground. Um, we do ask the Israelis for a response. They say they'll give it. Uh, often it doesn't come. So lots to talk about over the past 48 hours. That general strike, a form of resistance, appalling, grotesque repression you saw there in those two clips, and also a changing stance from the United States, from Joe Biden. To talk about all three things, I'm delighted to be joined by Nasser Al-Mazri, a Palestinian-American PhD candidate in political science at MIT and a member of the Palestinian youth movement. You know, most of our audience will be familiar with the purpose of a strike usually, is to, you know, to, to cause losses um, to your boss so that they have to listen to their workers. In this context, as a decolonial context or a context where you're fighting a state, what does a strike do? What, what's the strategy? What leverage is being is being used there? 
there are a number of different parts uh, that we can focus on here. So first, uh, this strike has beyond just having the economic consequences that it will have, which I'll discuss in a moment. Um, I think it was uh, important because it brought together Palestinian youth across all areas uh, where Palestinians uh, are living uh, and beyond Palestinian youth as well, of course. There's a bunch of civil society groups that were uh, sort of signed on to the strike as well. Um, but uh, historically, Palestinians have been very fragmented and uh, it's not just related to sort of internal struggles or ideology or location, etc. cetera, um, but it's just the fact that they live in different places and under different circumstances in refugee camps and other parts of the West Bank as Palestinian citizens uh, of Israel in historic Palestine, in Gaza, in Lebanon, et cetera. So I think that's one of the key components here. Um, but uh, to, to your, uh, more directly to the point here, uh, the strike um, had uh, significant consequences, I think, um, on the Israeli economy um, and sort of showed uh, sort of the, the power that Palestinians have. I think uh, one of the biggest sectors um, that, that sort of uses Palestinian labor uh, inside of Israel uh, is construction. And so there are something like 65,000 uh, construction uh, workers that come uh, from the occupied you know, West Bank uh, and come into Israel to work. Reportedly, 110 of them showed up out of 65,000. And so you can imagine the consequences. I, I, you know, I saw some numbers that were in the ballpark of uh, $40 million you know, uh, of, uh, uh, were basically lost yesterday, which I think translates to something like 30 million pound, British pounds, you know? So I, I think, you know, if we're, if we're talking about numbers, right, this is just in one day, and you can imagine that the delays and the backups uh, would become extremely costly. Um, and even be, beyond, you know, sort of uh, the, the construction uh, industry, you know, 50% uh, or so of pharmacists uh, inside uh, of, you know, historic Palestine inside of Israel, the um, Palestinian citizens of Israel, excuse me, you know, 50% of the pharmacists, they make up 25% of doctors and nurses, um, you know, more than half the construction workers. Uh, so we're talking about a, almost a fifth or, a, you know, around a fifth of, of, the, of the labor force didn't show up to work yesterday. Um, and so that, you know, you can imagine the consequences it had. Uh, you can imagine the pressure it puts um, on the Netanyahu government, uh, or well, on, on Benjamin Netanyahu and sort of this, this, uh, this process they're going through attempt to form a government. You can imagine the consequences it has, as you say, for their bosses, right? Sort of the end goal here was to, to leverage that power across all the places where Palestine, Palestinians are living uh, in order to, to sort of uh, make their voices heard um, in, in a more direct uh, material way, if you will. Let's talk about the other form of pressure being exerted on Israel right now, which is international. Um, I mean, calling it pressure might be being too kind to, to, to what Joe Biden is currently doing. But he has moved from, a, I suppose, a completely morally abject position, which is to say Israel has an absolute right to self-defense um, and therefore essentially you know, condoning um, the airstrikes in Gaza to saying what I want to see is a ceasefire. Is that a significant shift? Does that exert pressure on, on Benjamin Netanyahu? And you know, do you think that means a ceasefire will essentially happen quite quite soon now? Yeah, it's hard to say when it will happen. Um, I think there's something to think about here. I think uh, on the U.S. side, right, Biden has, you know, obviously the U.S. has blocked Security Council resolutions uh, multiple times this week. Uh, but Biden is feeling the pressure um, and he has. And, he, you know, this is the same thing with his immigration policy recently that he backtracked on. Uh, you know, the, we were talking about COVID uh, a little bit earlier and, and related to the patents, right? He's backtracked on a, a significant number of, of issues. And this is now, uh, you know, we're, the pressure is breaking through to him. What does it mean for an actual um, ceasefire? You know, I couldn't say uh, for certain, but it, it looks like, you know, the, the, the negotiations that have been, you know, ongoing sort of behind the scenes, it appears to, to be at a point where uh, Israel has a desire to continue pummeling Gaza, um, you know, using this sort of collective punishment. And so the fact that uh, Biden is finally leveraging pressure on Netanyahu, uh, I would imagine in the next week you're going to hear, if not a ceasefire, you're going to hear uh, an outcome of rejected ceasefire by Israel, which I think could potentially bring the United States and, and Israel at, at sort of loggerheads uh, about where they're going. I don't know for certain uh, if Netanyahu uh, uh, can withstand sort of Biden's pressure. We're going to find out uh, what he thinks he can do. Um, he's already taken uh, sort of actions that he wouldn't have taken uh, under uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, Obama's uh, uh, presidency. Um, and so it's unclear exactly what, uh, what is going to develop. But I, I have a sense that in the next week or so, you're going to see some, uh, some conclusions uh, coming out uh, regarding uh, whether they're going to stop or not.
Obviously, a, a ceasefire is urgently needed. At the same time, there is a, a danger that as soon as a ceasefire is announced, the world's media, you know, say, oh, problem solved. Quiet has happened again. Quiet has returned. The pressure goes off Joe Biden. And the scenes um, I showed at the, the, the start of this section of, of Israeli police firing you know, skunk water at people, rancid water at Palestinians, the kind of thing, you know, it just seems so degrading, so dehumanizing and throwing stun grenades at, at, at peaceful protesters, obviously the expulsion of citizens of, of Sheikh Jarrah. Um, the list can go on of the various oppressions which are separate from airstrikes in, in, in Gaza. Are, are you concerned that once a ceasefire happens, you know, Israel will essentially once again be off the hook? Yeah. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is not the first time that there's been uh, an extensive bombardment of Gaza. There's been, you know, coverage of it. And then uh, it sort of uh, went back to the status quo afterwards. It happened in 2014, 2008 and 9. You know, I could keep going back in time. Uh, and so I, I, I'm absolutely uh, with you that, that that is a potential danger. I think there's a couple things that are different uh, this time. Uh, so for the first time, uh, at least, uh, you know, um, in history, I say the first time in history, really, the U.S. Congress, uh, U.S. Congress people have made their voices heard regarding their concerns about not only uh, uh, Israeli actions, right? Concerns is a very light word. Uh, their their uh, complete opposition to sort of Israeli violence, uh, but they've also called on the president of the United States uh, and other uh, of their of their you know uh, counterparts in Congress to to bring about an end of U.S. support. Uh, to Israel, especially the blank check that they provide to Israel every year. And so I think, uh, I don't think we should uh, wash that away uh, as nothing. I think this is uh, a meaningful move in the right direction. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of Congress uh, has, has moved to the left, I think, to the surprise of some folks in the United States. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of younger folks increasingly are aware of what is going on in Palestine and elsewhere uh, and, and are strongly support, uh, supporting uh, sort of changes in, in U.S. policy. And that relates to the second point, which is, uh, a lot of this was broadcast on social media. Um, the the traditional news media, um, you know, you, you're not included, right? You, the the work being done here is fantastic, uh, but the traditional news media, we're talking CNN, Reuters, right, etc. A lot of these news media are not they're not giving fair coverage to Palestinians, and you know, I could I could share tons of statistics on how much they cover uh, Palestinian deaths versus Israeli deaths, for example. Uh, so I, I think there's a significant shift. Uh, in the uh, way people are understanding what's going on in Palestine, the views that people have. And I think th it's going to come to a tipping point at some point in the near future if it's not immediately after this uh, uh, sort of episode uh, of, of Israeli uh, violence, uh, then it will be in the near future because I think folks really are now understanding what is going on in Palestine. They're now uh, no longer uh, under the delusions uh, that the media has for so long uh, uh, sort of uh, presented, uh, you know, particularly the largest corporations in the media, I should say. And so um, I think that's a significant shift. But that being said, I think you're absolutely right. When things quiet down, people will, uh, you know, the status quo, returning to the status quo is not ideal. Gaza is still under siege. People still can't access uh, Health care. People are, you know, the 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 families in Sheikh Jarrah are, are still awaiting a court uh, ruling on whether they're allowed to live in their homes that they came to after they were forced out, uh, you know, in in uh, in the 1940s and, and 1950s. And so, uh, you know, this is, I think, um, definitely a great concern of Palestinians. I think this momentum is starting to push Palestinians to talk uh, uh, across, you know, sort of these. Uh, quote unquote borders that that exist between them, uh, and so uh, there's there's a strong hope that uh, further organization will will continue to occur um, among especially the the sort of re-energized youth uh, in Palestine. Uh, but uh, let's be honest, it's it's hard to to overturn oppressive regime uh, uh, policies, and so uh, this is going to be a, a difficult uphill fight. And so there needs to be a continuing spotlight uh, on what is going on. But um, yes, it's a concern. Yes, I think there's a lot of things different. And uh, I am actually, I think for the first time, uh, more hopeful than I am uh, uh, worried that the future will hold much of the same. Finally, I've got a very difficult question for you because it sort of sure. looks into the future. It's going to be some guesswork, I suppose. But you know, just just taking the general strike as an inspiration, if, you know, I, we've had lots of lots of Palestinians on in the last two weeks who have sort of said there does seem to be a level of unity among Palestinians, both, you know, within historic Palestine and in the diaspora, um, to an extent that hasn't been seen, you know, recently. Um, so, you know, with a speculative hat on, what kind of, you know, movements of resistance do you see going forward what do you think will be most most prominent you know we've got this general strike as an example now what should people be be watching out for do you think 
sort of a continuance uh, of, of strikes, I think you'll see. Um, I think this has been an immensely effective uh, and, you know, sort of uh, it's a type of it's a type of activity that can sort of focus folks on the same uh, uh, on the same target, which is, you know, in this case, the economy. One of the hardest things uh, is that uh, to, to, you know, to mobilize around the fact that there are so much divisions among Palestinians. And um, like I said, these, I'm talking about borders, the limitations for Palestinians to get uh, inside of, uh, uh, of Israel, uh, for the, you know, people in Gaza to, to connect with those in the West Bank. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking forward, I think actions like the strike uh, will be at least the starting point. I imagine that coordination across, uh, uh, you know, across uh, time and place is going to be difficult, made more difficult by Israel. There's been this attempt to sort of localize uh, the various struggles of Palestinians. Groups here are going to be folks in the West, um, you know, sort of leveraging their, you know, political power to pressure their governments uh, to sort of uh, uh, continue uh, pushing change uh, in Palestine. It's a difficult question. It really is. It's, you know, the, the Palestinians, you know, the people that I've spoken to who have very close family on the ground, uh, you know, myself and, and others, they're, they're saying that, you know, people are not sure what's going to come next, but people are energized and they're looking for for the, the sort of the next thing. Um, and so I imagine they'll start with, uh, you know, a continuance of strikes. I imagine uh, you'll see some new organizations uh, or, or the combination of multiple existing organizations coming together. Um, and uh, I think, you uh, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of question marks to be completely blunt, um, but uh, this is uh, more hope than than I think we've seen in a long time, uh, including from the older generation. I think that's something that really, uh, really has inspired me is they are excited for the first time in a long time.